Hey, how's it going? Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 4 and read verses 1 through 12. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ennis the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and everyone else in Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you completely healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And so the context of these verses, again, is that uh, crippled beggar that ends up getting healed. Peter and John walk up to him, um, and the power of God ends up healing him. And so he ends up getting really excited about that. It draws a crowd because all these people see that, wow, this guy that we've seen every day that uh, used to not be able to walk, he can walk now. He's jumping around. He's praising God. And so Peter ends up giving his sermon. And afterwards, we see the response in verse 1, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And so now these, these leaders um, are greatly disturbed. Sadducees are greatly disturbed because of this. And so we see a very similar behavior by the Sadducees and some of these religious leaders that we see in the Gospels and that we saw in the book of Matthew where they become extremely jealous when any kind of uh, good thing is happening that they're not a part of. Um, and so they're greatly disturbed by this, uh, greatly disturbed, obviously, by Jesus and the resurrection of the dead, because um, I believe the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, but also that somebody that you put to death, uh, if that guy actually is the Messiah, well, that's maybe not so, uh, not so nice to think about. Verse 3, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard their message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So there we see another uh, number. We see in, at the end of Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 41, uh, that about 3,000 were added to their number when Peter kind of gives that first sermon. Um, and now there are about 5,000. So um, the, Peter and John end up getting seized. They're thrown in jail, uh, thrown in prison. Uh, but still lots of people end up believing there are about 5,000 people at that point. So we're still seeing the growth there. Um, sometimes I wonder, you know, with stories with uh, people like Joseph, uh, where people are thrown in jail, what their mental state was during that time. And sometimes I kind of feel like maybe uh, maybe we project that people were kind of bulletproof and not feeling any down emotions. Um, but I think with this one where Peter and John were thrown in jail over that, uh, over that evening until the next day, I kind of think they were still full of faith. I kind of still think that they were like really excited, really pumped up and ready to go, excited about the number of salvations, excited about the healing, excited about the work that was being done, especially when we see Peter's response in verse 8. But in verse 5 and 6, we see that uh, some leaders, uh, religious leaders, are going to go question uh, Peter and John. Verse 7, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Apparently, they weren't listening very closely to the sermon because uh, uh, Peter obviously answers that kind of question in the sermon. In verse 8, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, and I mean, come on now, the Spirit is going to talk. The Spirit, even in an interrogation, Peter is going to preach. Uh, and in verse 9, 10, 11, 12, we see this just kind of short little sermon uh, that know this, you and everyone else in Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you completely healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. I mean, the boldness that Peter had 
has is absolutely crazy. And the neat thing that I, I, I always think about Peter is that he is the guy that all through the gospels is the one that's just jutting out, you know, or just saying, saying stuff that maybe he shouldn't exactly say, saying stuff maybe before he thinks. But that weakness that he has, God actually flips around and redeems that and uses that for good because that same boldness to just kind of say, uh, say whatever he uses to be able to then preach, even while he's being interrogated, he's still preaching. And that is an amazing, amazing level of boldness. And my question for you is what weakness do you have right now that God could turn for good? So I'll just leave you with that and let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your word and for your scripture. And I just pray that you would just turn those weaknesses we have around for your good, Lord God. Because we know that when we're weak, uh, we're strong because you're strong, Lord God. And we just pray that you would be with us and uh, and show us that. And we just pray that you turn those weaknesses for good. We just thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.